fans, Chris Durrell here with RotorPros.com and bring you another DFS PGA video. Before we get into that, I want to tell you a little bit about RotorPros. If you head over to the website here, RotorPros.com, this is where you're going to find our free content. Uh, you can go up to articles here. Um, you can click on each individual sport. We've got strategy articles, um, or you can just click on articles. You can see all the articles. You can learn a little bit more about us um, and our DFS team that we have here. Uh, Harris, Chris, Dane, Kenny, and Ryan. Um, you can also get your free trial by clicking on the yellow sign up button at the top right hand corner and picking either weekly, monthly, or yearly subscription. You're going to get the free trial with that. And if you use RotoPro's promo code RP50 right now, you're going to get 50% off uh, once your trial is up on your first payment. So we, we cover right now, we're covering NHL, NBA, PGA, NASCAR, uh, a little bit of League of Legends in there. We've got EPL soccer, UCL soccer. Um, Dane's been covering almost anything soccer when he has the time to get that up for you. We've got uh, UFC. Kenny's bringing you some awesome UFC picks, uh, UFC cheat sheet out there as well. So to get access to those cheat sheets, get over, check everything out that we have over at rotopros.com. With that, let's jump into this week's video. Two events this week. We're going to cover them both here. First of all, we'll go over the World Golf Championship event. Normally, this is the WGC Mexico um, with COVID-19, the travel restrictions, uh, that has been canceled, postponed. I'm not sure if it's coming back next year. Either way, the Florida Swing is going to start early this year, and the WGC this time is going to be the Workday Championships, and it's held at the Concession Golf Club. Uh, so we're going to look at that here real quick. So we've got uh, two par fives uh, under 400 yards, five from 400 to 450, and four from uh, four or three from 450 plus. The the par fives, some of them are pretty meaty here. We've got a 590 yard 17th hole. We've got a 606 yard seventh hole, 577 yard third, and then uh, the 13th is one of the easier ones at 545 yards. We don't have any statistics on this course but just kind of reading through some stuff on pga tour.com these par fives look to be very hard um so keep that in mind something i'm going to be watching out for as the tournament goes especially in terms of looking at uh targeting guys for showdowns in rounds two three and four um this is a no cut event uh so everyone in the field here as you can see is going to play all the rounds we've got an elite field um, every player inside the top 10 and 48 of the top 50 in the world are teeing it up this week so we've got I would say a little bit more major like pricing, a little bit softer. As you can see, we've got no one over 12K um, and we've got some pretty darn good players I'll talk about here in a bit that seem to be a little bit underpriced just kind of due to the field strength. So we're going to talk about that here shortly. I just want to go over this course scene as um, the only one that I know of actually two. I don't think CT Pan is in this field. Just let me double check here. He is not. So the only one that I know of in this field uh, that has played this, Bryson DeChambeau back in 2015. I um, believe it, it wasn't the U.S. Amateur. It was the collegiate uh, event. Uh, he won the singles event there for SMU. Uh, so he's got, he was minus eight, I believe, over four days on this course. So kind of translating that over, I mean, it was, it was six, seven years ago, six years ago now, uh, that event, and it was, you know, a completely different field. The course could be, you know, a little bit changed by then. But I'm, I'm kind of looking at a winning score. I don't think it's going to be too high. I think this is going to be a fairly tough test. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute when we go through the course. But I'm looking at a winning score somewhere between minus 12 to minus 15. I'm going to show you why here. Um, so, you know, you look at this opening hole. We've got a ton of bunkers. Um, as you can see right off the bat, undulation on the greens. That's one thing that you're going to hear a lot of this week. Uh, a little bit smaller on average. I believe it's around 6,000 square feet per green. Um, but there's a lot of bunkering around these greens and a lot of undulation. So that's going to make, you know, when you're looking at the strokes gained approach at the iron game, which is going to be important, um, I'm going to be breaking down strokes gained approach as one of my top stats. But within that um, strokes gained approach stat, I'm going to be looking a lot at proximity proximity distance is kind of in that mid range for your long hitters and proximity ranges you know those long proximity ranges for some shorter guys if you're targeting them um simply because i don't think guys are just going to be gunning it down there uh bryson going to be hitting 350 360 yard drives if he is there could be some trouble simply because there's a lot of water it's in playing 13 of the holes here um so it's going to force i think a lot of just trying to hit the fairway uh, just because there's so much trouble lurking off the tee. So we're going to see, you know, generally we're going to want some mid-iron uh, attacks, but, you know, we're going to want some of that long iron baked into our models this week as well if guys are going to be laying back a little bit just to kind of play it safe. 
um, as to not give up a bunch of strokes to the field. So not only is uh, approach going to be important this week, like look at this whole number three green. Like, the runoffs there are absolutely incredible. We're going to see a lot when they put the flag over here um, on the left side of this green. You know, if if guys are going to play safe, they're going to play to the green over here. But, you know, if you're going to be attacking that pin, we're going to see a lot of balls in this bunker and a lot of balls just kind of running off the green. I think the stamp has got it at like 12. So we got a little bit faster um, Bermuda greens here. So keep that in mind. Um, that's going to lead me to also like this kind of little overhead view of uh, hole number four, uh, surrounded by bunkers again. Um, this isn't out of bounds stuff, but there's a lot of water, marshes, trees, um, just protecting these greens. So the approach shot is going to be huge. And like I said, just overall ball striking is going to be huge. Like look at number six here. You got this bunker that totally surrounds the whole entire thing. And where there's no bunker, there's water. Uh, so very tough. So the one thing that I am after the strokes gain approach, after the par four scoring, I'm really looking at strokes gain around the green uh, with a lot of emphasis on sand saves because with those runoffs, with these undulated greens, if guys aren't hitting the green, I think we're probably going to see somewhere in that 60%, 60 to 65% range in terms of GIR. I think um, the guys that are going to kind of be in that top half come Sunday and still competing uh, for the win or at least a top 10 here are going to be uh, pretty good around the green if they're not absolutely dialed in with those irons this week. So I think that's going to be an important part. And then if you want to put it in just because of the greens, just because of the undulation, you maybe want to look at maybe a little bit of three putt avoidance. Um, we could see a lot of three putts here with some tough putts. Like if you're hitting the green on the wrong level on some of these greens here, I'll see if I can find one that's a little bit yeah, so this one's pretty undulated. So if you were to hit it here, I mean, it's going to be tough to get it in range and to get a two putt on some of these putts. So three putt avoidance can definitely uh, be key. Um, looking at that on some of these undulated greens, it's something I include in my models on a lot of these undulated green um, golf courses. So as you can see, just kind of flipping through all the holes here, a um, lot of water, a lot of sand, smaller undulated greens. So you're going to have to be good pretty much T to green um, and then we're going to be looking for some guys who are maybe uh, putting a little bit better on Bermuda. So we'll go back here. We'll look at some plays that stand out here for me this week. Uh, at the top, like I said, I think Stars and Scrubs with a no-cut event always is in play, just simply because the price on these top guys is, is pushed down a little bit, a little bit softer. We've got a lot bigger top tier. Um, the bottom tier guys, the, the, the so-called Scrubs, aren't exactly scrubs so like i said we got 48 of the top 50 players in the world here so that's definitely going to be one way to go it's probably going to be the chalky build if you're doing that there's three guys that i really like at the top um it, it's close between rom and johnson over 11k here but for me uh john rom has just been a little bit better off the tee than dj lately both have been tremendous with their irons um, the, over these last two events, especially both have struggled with their putters a little bit. They haven't lost like a stroke. They're losing about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 strokes putting per round. So it, it's not a, a huge deal or a big concern, not like a Morikawa losing seven strokes by any means, um, much like last week. But uh, the iron games are on. Uh, T to green, uh, both DJ and Rom are looking good. But Rom's been a little bit better, like I said, uh, off the tee here lately. I think he's going to break through. He is my favorite play in this top tier. Um, so I'm going to be going after him. He's been pretty good in the WGCs. St. Jude last year wasn't great. And I'm not weighing this into uh, my model more than if I slide over here to the right. As you can see in my model, I've got nothing on that WGC history right now. And just for reference here, for anyone that is new to the sheet, what I'm looking at here, you've got official world golf rank, and that's just kind of a reference point. You've got odds. You've got the salaries for both sites. Um, we've got the odds ranking, DK ranking, FanDuel ranking, and then this is just a differential between DK ranking and odds and FanDuel, just to see if we can point out some players that may be a little bit overpriced, maybe a little bit underpriced. So for instance, um, compared to his odds, Matthew Fitzpatrick is a little bit overpriced on DK and FanDuel. Um, he's the 20th and 21st most expensive golfer on those sites, but he's 26 and odds. I'm not too concerned about that. I'll talk about that in a bit. I definitely like Fitzpatrick. As you can see here, he's a green core play for me, but that's one thing. And then this is blue section is normally course history, but because this course, this is the first time that it has been used on the PGA tour. We don't have any course history. So I went back and I put WGC stats and I left off the match play um, just because I wanted to reference the stroke play events only average finish in those events and average DraftKings scoring. 
And then we slide over and we look at current form. This is each player's last 10 events. Um, their average finish last 5 and 10 and average DK last 5 and 10. And then we get into stats in the green section. These are the raw stats. So if you're looking at strokes gained approach, this is Dustin Johnson gaining 1.147 strokes gained approach on the field for the season. Now, this isn't season stats. This is 90% current season, 10% last season. I always try and grab a little bit of sample size from last season just to kind of balance it out. And of course, the larger the sample size, I definitely like better. Um, for shorter sample size, I like using Fantasy National Golf Club. We can really start breaking it down into uh, last four, eight, 12, 24 rounds uh, data. So I kind of compare the two models together, and I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit as well. So this is there's a ton of different stats here. Uh, generally, each week I concentrate on the strokes gain stats. Uh, ball striking is always huge for me, and it just comes down to how I weigh approach versus off the tee and that all depends it's very course dependent so that's going to change every week but those two are definitely going to be core when we're looking at ball striking uh par four or five scoring birdie or better percentage correlates very highly with DraftKings scoring so that's always going to be in my model when you slide over and look at the orange section here this is just the rankings of all those stats from the green section so that we can actually form a model um so we got a hundred percent uh, spread across here. So I've got 25% on strokes gain approach, 10% on around the green and off the tee. We've got some long iron proximity, like I discussed, some par four scoring, very important, some par five scoring, a little less important uh, to me so far. I'm going to evaluate round one and maybe adjust that going into showdowns for rounds two to four. Birdie or better percentage and then sand save as well, um, like I had talked about. And then over here on the right, this is the overall stats model. So this looks at the ranking of the stats model combined with uh, course history, odds to win the, the tournament, and form. These four and form. And then you have to divide that into 100 or make that equal 100 here. And then you get your overall rankings on the far right and the far left. So that's kind of how I use the sheet each week. And like I said, it changes every, every week for the full tournament. And then throughout the week, uh, for showdowns, I will also come in here and tweak things as we go through round one, two, three, and four. I will put some weight on those for scoring a little bit more on birdie or better percentage because that's very important in terms of showdowns. So keep that in mind. John Rahm definitely stands out, like I said. Uh, Shoffley and Thomas, number two and three in the model here. I kind of leaning Xander a little bit more over Rom and just looking at uh, Fantasy National right now, he's gained strokes in seven of his last eight, sorry, eight of his last or eight straight uh, in terms of strokes gained approach. Uh, he's been putting very well. Um, when it comes to Justin Thomas, I've been on him for a while. I've just been waiting for him to break out. He missed the cut last week. I think he may be a nice pivot this week. I'm about to check ownership on Wednesday, but keep, keep in mind, uh, he ruined a lot of people's lineups last week especially me, um, lost six strokes putt in. So that was just absolutely terrible. He didn't gain a stroke in any strokes gained area. Uh, is this a sign of him breaking down or is he going to bounce back? Uh, if he's going to be lower owned, I'm probably going to be, I'm, I'm going to have more ownership than the field uh, versus Shoffley. I'm really, it's going to come down to those two guys in terms of ownership come Wednesday night when you start breaking down the projections. Tony Finau, very interesting here. I thought maybe after losing last week, like literally going down the stretch, uh, he was in the clubhouse, sitting sitting with that with that lead. All is Max Homa had to do on the 18th hole. He had, I think it was a four foot three, four foot putt. He puts that, he wins. He missed, forcing a playoff. Give Tony just open the door for Tony to get into the playoff there and win. He couldn't do it again. Um, I thought maybe he'd maybe go back to the Puerto Rico Open to try and uh, drum up some of that because that's where he got his only career win back in 2015, I believe it was, for that. But either way, this week, I think a lot of people are going to be uh, a little butthurt over him not winning, although he, he did finish second, and there is a lot to be excited about with Tony Finau. Looking at just this 2020-2021 season so far, looking at the stats, he is second in strokes gained tee to green and ball striking in this field, second in strokes gained approach, third in opportunities gained, second in birdie or better, uh, 30th in putting. So the putting is kind of what's let him down and not uh, grab that win and uh, second in DraftKings scoring. So there's a lot to like with Tony Finau here. And if he's going to be uh, a little bit lower owned because he didn't win last week, although he made it into a playoff after being seven strokes down going into that final round, uh, I don't know what people are missing here. I'm going to keep 
riding that Tony Finau train until he gets that win. Uh, I, I think I'll even be – I 21 to 1 is a little, little low is, is for a, an outright bet. I would rather load up on like a John Rahm at 11 to 1 if you're going to go that route. That's As for outright so far this week, I'm kind of looking at this top range with a couple guys, a little bit heavier bets, and then just kind of going down and grabbing a few – uh, lower to mid range guys, kind of in that 50 to 100 to one range. But I will post my final bets towards the end of the week in, in chat. Going down a little bit, I definitely like Victor Hovland. I uh, didn't do so well in the WGC St. Jude, but again, I'm not really, I'm not weighing that at all right now. What I am weighing is form coming in, and Hovland is getting to be about as good as it gets here in terms of form. He's got top five finishes in three of his last four. He's gained 9.5 strokes in his last two events uh, on approach. Um, he's also gained, which is very positive in terms of his putting. We've always talked about him as he's going to, once he figures that putter out, he's going to break through. Um, and here we go. He's gained 5.2 strokes putting over his last two events. Can he make it three in a row? Um, it's not even that crazy to think that he probably could because he's gained three in a row as all the way back to uh, uh, August and September last year over the playoff events, uh, Northern Trust BMW and and tour, or sorry, the PGA Championship, Northern Trust and BMW going into the playoffs after that PGA Championship gained uh, strokes pied in, in three straight and then in five of six events. So I'm definitely liking that there. Uh, Matthew Fitzpatrick, I definitely like. He's always come, played very well with the top p- top players in the world in these WGC events, uh, seventh or better in four of his last five. He's coming off a nice event here last week as well. Scotty Scheffler. Um, definitely liking um, in this tier. I think he's going to be a little bit lower on. He's been all right, uh, top 25, top 26, T26 at the WGC Mexico, T15 at the St. Jude last year. Uh, he's coming in with some nice form, top 20s and two straight. Jason Day feels a little bit lower, on, or sorry, uh, underpriced, under 8K. It just seems a little crazy. I know it's a little bit of a roller coaster ride when it comes to Jason Day in terms of his finishes. He's either missing the cut by four or five strokes uh, or, you know, banking us a top 10. So I'm going to take that risk this week, being that it's a WGC event. As you can see, he's finished 11th or better in four of his last five WGCs, coming off a T7 um, last week. Just wanted to just quickly peek at his stats here from last week. Or sorry, not, not last week. That was the AT&T Pro-Am, which was nice to see after he had missed cuts at the Farmers and the Waste Management as well. Uh, he turned around. He, he also lost a stroke on approach, but was awesome around the green and putting. Uh, so I definitely like to see that here at this course. I feel like it's kind of similar. I know the greens aren't as small as the AT&T, but I feel like that around the green and putting is going to be huge here at this course as well. Ryan Palmer, uh, 10th in my model. He's just a little bit underpriced here as well for the season that he's had. Uh, he, in terms of this field, he's 15th in ball striking, 17th tee to green, 8th in par 4 scoring, and 8th in birdie or better percentage. So there's a lot to like with Palmer. He's been extremely consistent uh, going back to, he missed the cut at the U.S. Open, but since that U.S. Open, he's made the cut in five straight events with three top fives and four top 25. So he's just been very consistent. So for this price, he's he's been consistent with the approach shot. He's been consistent just ball striking overall. So 7,200 on DraftKings, 8,600 on FanDuel. I'm definitely on board. And then two value guys that I'm looking at right here, right now, uh, early in the week, uh, Abraham Anser. He's been awesome at the competing with the big boys at these WGC events lately. He's coming off of a, a poor event. I believe that was last week he missed the cut. I'm just going to bring that up here quickly. We'll go over that. Yes, at the Genesis. So his problem lately, uh, he's lost strokes around the green and on the green putting combined in three straight and lost strokes in six straight around the green. Um, So that's kind of been his downfall, why he's missed the cut at the Sony and the Genesis. But Sam is straight in between that as a top five at the Amex. Um, where his ball striking was on. So, I mean, that would probably would have been a win or at least contending for the win on Sunday had he uh, putted or been a little bit better around the green. And generally his putting, I, we're never worried about going back and looking at his last 20 events. He's gaining about 1.2 strokes per event. Um, so I'm expecting the putting to turn around. And when it does, I can kind of see another top 10 upside from him, maybe in this event. But uh, what I'm really looking for out of him this week, if the putter even gets back to field average, is something around the lines of like a top 25. And I think for 6,800, that's tremendous. 8,100 on FanDuel. 
And kind of the same story for uh, Lanto Griffin here. He seems a little bit underpriced compared to uh, what he's been doing lately. Like he's in this field for the, he's got a lot of sample size, 38 rounds so far this season out of this field this week. He's top 10 in strokes gain approach that jumps off the page there right away. For me, he lost 0.1 strokes on approach last week. Before that, he had gained strokes in nine straight on the approach, uh, nine straight events. The putter has been absolutely on fire. He's gained strokes in that area in five straight and seven of his last eight. So there's a lot to like about Lanto. T26 and T7 in his last two events. He's trending in terms of form. And again, a top 25, I think, would be tremendous out of him. I think uh, top 25 to top 30, as long as he's, you know, putting together some birdies, him and answer make a lot of sense and a reason why I think another reason why I think stars and scrubs uh, is definitely going to be a way to go this week because you get a lot of safety. It feels like with these guys sub seven K with a lot of upside combined in there as well. Uh, I'm going to look at a lot more guys down in this lower six K range later in the week. I'm going to highlight a few more plays and then Dane and I will also have up our DFS rankings points per dollar rankings for each price range on Wednesday as well. So that covers the WGC workday. Now we will jump into the Puerto Rico Open. Um, this is the first year I've done a sheet for both events at the same time. Um, I wanted to put it together. The field is not as great as you can tell. The average, average official world golf rankings, 804. Um, let's just sort that here just for a minute. I'll have a No one inside the top 50 is here. And we've only got five players inside the top 100. Uh, that makes it a little bit difficult. The first thing that jumps off the page here when looking at that is the prices for these guys that we normally see in the 7K range are now in the 9 and 10K range. It's going to make building lineups feel weird, um, but we just kind of go off the statistics um, and we'll we'll try and build a lineup off of that. There, there's definitely some things that we're going to look at. So first of all, let's look at the course. It is a little... Uh, not a little bit. It's a lot different. Um, in terms of course history, we're seeing winning scores last year. Hovland won minus 20. Um, Martin Trainer 15. DA points, minus 20. Tony Fino back in 2016. There's that Tony Fino win, minus 12, minus 7. Um, so we, we're going to see more birdies than we do at the WGC. We're back to the cut of top 65 and ties, so keep that in mind for this event. Um, looking at the course, a little bit wider off the tee, a little more forgiving off the tee. There is a little bit of water. I believe there's eight water hazards in total. Um, there's less bunkering here. The greens are a little safer. These are past Palum greens. Uh, we don't have a lot of data on past Palum. So I'm just looking at general strokes gain putting coming in, but it's not going to be key. Key for me here this week is again going to be strokes gained approach. Um, good drive percentage, I think, makes sense here, being that the if you get off of the fairways, it's not as penal out there. They're going to be able to go a little bit wide off those. As you can see, it's a lot more open. So there's going to be some shots coming from the from the rough. It's not going to be too bad. So good drive percentage makes a lot of sense in there as well. But strokes gain approach, uh, if you want to put in a little bit of rough proximity, possibly, even though this rough isn't going to be as penal as, as we see on other courses. Um, the greens are protected, again, by some bunkering. But generally, they're going to be – there are – about 500 to 600 uh, feet, square feet on average, bigger than we see at the, the Workday Championship this week. Um, so a little more forgiving there. But generally, I'm looking at strokes gain approach, birdie or better percentage, par four scoring for this event. And I've got that into the model over here. Approach over off the tee. Um, I think distance can definitely help us out, but it's not something I'm looking at um, as key for me here this week. Par four over par five. We're going to see some eagles. We look at the course statistics here. Got some eagles on that par five uh, hole number two. Um, we see some eagles on the 18th hole. This is going back two years and looking at just the stats here. So a little bit of eagles. So for par fives, I'm looking at par five birdie or better percentage over versus just par five scoring. Um, if you're using Fantasy National, again, you can maybe throw in a little bit of eagle, eagle rate in there, eagle percentage, eagles gained. Um, a little bit of course history in here, but again, not very high on the course history. There's a lot of players without that course history this week. So uh, that's something else I do with my cheats is build multiple models. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with that, you what you want to do, like what you're seeing now is view only. You can't make any adjustments. You can't sort any columns. So what you're going to want to do is go up to file, make a copy, name it whatever you'd like and click okay that can, that again is going to create your own copy you're going to be able to sort rows so like for instance if you wanted to sort by uh odds to win you just come in here and click on one of these odds go up to the top and click on data uh sort a to z 
and then you're going to sort by odds. You can do that once you make your own copy. Something else that you can do is adjust the model. Um, whether you want to adjust the stats model specifically, uh, whether you want to adjust the overall model. So if you want to build an overall model and see the rankings, just looking at statistics, you would erase all of this here and just go 100% on stats. That's going to give you the stats model ranking. Um, if you want to go maybe 80% on stats, 20% on odds to win. If you want to maybe go 60% on stats, 20% on odds to win, and 20% on DraftKings scoring over the last five events, you can go that way. So sometimes what I will do if we get a field like this Puerto Rico Open where we've got a lot of players with course history, but we've also got a lot of players, especially in the top ranges, that don't have course history, is I'll go and I'll build two models. So I'll make a copy of the sheet. I'll have my original model, and then I'll go in and I'll build a secondary model, and I'll take out course history, um, and I'll tweak it a little bit. And then I'll look at the rankings of that model and the rankings of my other model, and just kind of compare them and see what players stand out in both models, which ones stand out when we're looking when we take course history out, and just build as many. You know, some weeks I'll build four or five different models and just start comparing players. It all depends on how much time I have, um, but generally my main model that you're going to see. Uh, when I release the sheet is going to be like my cash game model overall. And then, like I said, I'll tweak throughout the week and start making other models um, just to kind of compare players. Um, even if I'm just looking at the stats model, I want to go in um, and I don't back test as much as, as I would like to just, I cover too many sports. There's too much. There's just not enough hours in the day for me to go back and back test. I would really like to, um, but I'll, sometimes on these courses especially like the masters coming up let's say uh where we have course history is huge where i'm looking at course history i'll maybe come and build some specific models or go and back test my stats model um and look at the correlations of DraftKings scoring at our finishing position for like the last three years in terms of the stats model that i had in there and then just kind of tweak it going into years ahead but generally it's a pretty close to the same model each and every week for every course. And I will just tweak things just a tiny little bit, depending on uh, little nuances with the course or little differences in the course, like we talked about between um, the Grand Reserve this week versus the concession golf club uh, at the workday at the other event this week. So there is some differences there, but generally I'm looking at a couple of players I'm looking at targeting here. Emiliano Grillo, number one in the model. He's had top fives in each of his last two uh, trips to this event. He's made the cut in all four. He's coming in with a little bit of form. He's probably got, um, you know, he's had some showing the most upside of any of these guys at the top. Thomas Peters, number one in price and going to be GPP only. He's just going to be a lot tougher to build around in an event like this. But he was tremendous at the U.S. Open. That's his last time he's, he's teed it up on the PGA Tour. Um, that was back in September. But uh, when he gets going, I mean, he could run away. He's the kind of player that uh, could be putting together 25, 30 birdies and running away with this thing. He's also the kind of player that could be driving a bunch in the water and uh, not make the cut. So GPP only just uh, with his upside. Brandon Grace, um, definitely back on him here this week. Um, it's been a while since I've been on him. This is kind of the field where we want to look to target him. He's been struggling a little bit overall in some of these bigger events. Um, but in 2021, he, he missed the cut at the Sony open. He lost strokes in every single area, but since then things have started to trend up. He finished T34 at the, um, AT&T Pebble beach pro called the pro. am it wasn't the pro am this year at the Pebble beach this year. Um, he gained strokes both off the tee and approach and putting, uh, struggled around the green. And then the Genesis last week, he finished T20. He gained over five strokes T to green. That was tremendous to see. Uh, especially considering he lost 1.3 strokes off the tee and negative, uh, po or sorry, 0.7 strokes he lost uh, putting as well. So the approach shot, he gained 4.2 strokes and he was excellent around the green. So I love seeing that from Grace coming into this event. Um, he's a player that has a lot more, uh, you know, he's 147th in the world, but he's got a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of upside with Grace. Um, and he's had some, he's had some decent form, like I said, coming in. Jonathan Vegas is going to be GPP only. He just seemed, he's a player that's a little bit overpriced. Um, it feels like more than other players. So he's going to be GPP only for me. He's lost strokes on approach in three straight. He's lost strokes around the green in five straight and putting in two straight. So there's just not enough for me to trust him in like a cash game build. So GPP only there. Uh, excellent to see that he's got course history there 
uh, top 10 last year. Justin Sue, number one in my mo number one in my model. I don't know how this is going to shake out in terms of uh, ownership for this event, but in terms of this field, anyway, he's got only only got 14 rounds this season. But in this field, he's fourth in ball, ball striking, first in approach, fifth in proximity. So the iron game is solid. I like to see that. He's 17th in par four scoring, third in birdie or better percentage, and first in putting in those events. And he so far this year, he has played Corrales. Uh, T14, T8 at the Shriners. He missed the cut at the Bermuda and then uh, followed that up with uh, back in January after an extended break from that Bermuda in November. Like it, I think it's uh, looks like two and a half months almost he took off, um, taken off. And at the Farmers, he posted a T37, gaining 1.5 strokes on approach, 0.4 strokes around the green, and 4.3 strokes put in. So that was awesome to see from Sue. Um, so I definitely like him at 9,000. I'm going to be taking some shots with him, even though he missed the cut here last year. He's a, He's got some more experience now. I can see him making a cut and, and uh, have that top 10 upside and possibly being there um, on Sunday con contending for the win. Going down a little bit, there's a couple of players that stand out to me uh, kind of in that mid-range, and that is Bronson Bragoon and Cameron Percy. First of all, with Bergoon, he's just been solid. He's made three straight cuts, although it's only been a T47, T42, T37 at those events. Uh, had trouble at Pebble Beach. He lost 6.4 strokes on approach after gaining over six in the, in the, at the Farmers and the Amex combined. But uh, the putter was hot, which saved him uh, making the cut there that week. So I definitely like him in this field. Cameron Percy. Um, I like a little bit more just simply because of the approach shot. He comes in gaining strokes on approach in four, five of his last six events that count. That leaves out the Bermuda and, and Corrales. He gained, he would have gained, you know, looking at shot trucker, he would have gained at Corrales. There's a T8 there. Um, so the iron game has been on. He's been decent around the greens. He's not losing strokes around the green. He's not losing a ton of strokes putting. Um, he's kind of, you know, between that negative one to plus two gained strokes per round there so over the last two events he's gained over seven strokes t to green so definitely looking at percy in that mid 7k range in this field seems like these two players uh excellent value scott brown um good to see him come back with a finish in his last event because the form wasn't there he had missed three straight uh four of his five cuts there but he went to pebble beach he gained 1.7 strokes on approach, finished with a T30 there. That was awesome to see because he comes in with some excellent course history. I used him as a, my one-and-done pick here last year because if anyone's in a one-and-done league, make sure you make your, both your picks this week. Um, Scott Brown was my pick last year because of the course history. As you can see, he let me down. I'm going right back to the well with him this week. Um, and it's pretty close. It's either him or Brandon Grace, but that's kind of who I've narrowed it down to. I'm going to have more picks up for this event. I haven't dug in completely into the into the models yet or made my separate models for this. I will do that, provide some more, and I am going to provide a skeleton for both events this week. So stay tuned for that. I'll have one and done picks for both. I'll have outright top five, 10, and 20 picks for both. And then I'm gonna I'll for I'm gonna guarantee that I will have the workday championship in tournament statistics for showdown updated. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to do the Puerto Rico Open. It's my seven year old daughter's birthday she's six right now it's going to be her seventh birthday on monday but we're headed up to the city for her birthday this weekend on sunday um, and saturday so i'm not 100 percent i'll be able to get the puerto rico done in terms of in tournament stats but i'm sure going to try for you guys if you have any information or information if you have any questions that you're looking for of any information that i did not cover in this video uh make sure to hit me up in the chats make sure to hit me up on twitter make sure to hit me up pretty much anywhere um thanks for watching the video make sure to like and subscribe and we will see you next week. Good luck out there.